Hi, my name is Melissa McKee McGrath. I'm a CPDTKA and I'm here to answer Reddit's questions about dogs. So I decided a couple weeks ago that I had done a kids ask questions to a dog trainer um, and I had so much fun with it that I decided to solicit other questions. I wasn't getting a lot of hits. I wasn't getting a lot of interesting questions. So I decided instead to go to Reddit and type in does a dog question mark are dogs question mark and why do dogs question mark and I got some really fun answers that other people have already asked to Reddit and I thought that I would take them on. So here we go. The first question, how good are dogs? Well, professionally speaking, they're pretty good. Uh, objectively, subjectively, it doesn't matter how you cut it. They're the best. Next question, are dogs supposed to sleep like this or is mine broken? Well, Dogs are notorious for breaking all conventional rules of physical limitations, especially while they're sleeping. Let's take a look. So in this particular case, I think someone mixed up their build a cat kit and build a dog kit. This one, swing and a miss. Madison looks like she fell down the stairs in a horror movie and she just kind of gave up. I don't think puppies are born with bones. I'm pretty sure that's that's not physically possible. Oh, oh, this poor dog. And then we have strange surface preferences. We have Bailey sleeping on rocks next to the bed. We have uh, Max sleeping mostly on a box. And we have my friend here sleeping with a door jam as a pillow. So no, your dog is decidedly not broken. That's just dog. Next question. Why are dogs easier to train than cats? I think this is an excellent question because I think that there's a myth out there that you cannot train cats um, and that is patently false. You can totally train cats. Um, there's a couple of factors of why dogs might be considered easier to train than cats. Um, including um, studies by Dr. Monique Erdell and Dr. Clive Wynn. Now, if you are unfamiliar with these uh, amazing researchers, you need to stop everything and then go and read everything that they've ever done because it's really, really fascinating. Uh, Dr. Clive Wynn had actually written a book called Dog is Love that I could not put down earlier this year. So go ahead and re uh, put that on your Amazon wish list. It's so great. Um, but they suggested that dogs were domesticated about 5,000 years before cats. Now, what does that mean about their, the cat's trainability? Well, let's look at what we were uh, domesticating dogs to do. We were domesticating them to work with people to do tasks. Dogs were supposed to be working with people to hunt and to guard and to provide comfort. Dogs can uh, find truffles and help us with um, all sorts of tasks, carting and pulling and dog sledding. These dogs were bred to do very specific tasks, generally in tandem with people. And in the case of livestock guardians, without people, but for people. So they had to have a level of social ability with at least a person and be able to do their job. Cats, well, we basically like genetically created these dogs, these cats to have middle fingers. But in all seriousness, like cats have always been more considered, um, ha cats have always been considered more to be a little bit more um, independent. I think I, I really like that word for cats. They're more independent. They hunt on their own. They come and go as they please. And we don't tend to think of them as pets that we can train. We don't usually, broadly speaking, think of them as animals that we would take um, to, a, to a class to do sit down stay. We don't think of them as creatures that we take on vacation or that we take on a walk three times a day or four times a day. We don't think of them as animals that we go hiking with, but dogs we do. And I think part of that is on us as dog trainers and that we have done a really great job is of educating the general public. You need to train your pet. You need to train your dog. You need to prepare it to walk on a leash. You need to be able to expose it to all of these different things called socialization. 
And socialization, as misunderstood as it is colloquially, and we're going to have a little link up here to show you, um, describe exactly what socialization is and is not, especially in the time of COVID-19 with people getting dogs um, to keep them company during the quarantine. So we got a little link up here. Um, but cats, we tend to think of, we can get a cat and it can just kind of be around and then I can go on vacation for two or three days and use a self-feeder. Um, many cats are gregarious and they crave human attention. Many do not, but many do. And cats are still very trainable and very willing to learn. Um, my cat Rohan actually knows how to spin, sit, and target so I can get her up and off of objects in my home. Um, and I can also do cat nail trims without getting bitten, generally speaking. Um, you can see the effects of a cat nail trim that went poorly this week because my daughter came running in to help and the cat got scared. But generally speaking, um, I can do these tasks without getting injured and the cat is usually in a great place. Um, so if you're thinking about trainability, I actually think that if you can train a cat or a chicken or a goldfish or a gerbil or a hamster, you can train anything. And I think the way that we have bred dogs, we have bred them to be more forgiving for our bad handling. And there's no other um, example more clear to me than a choke chain. Our dogs will still crawl into bed with us at the end of the day after we've put a choke chain on it or a prong collar or a shock collar in all in the name of training our best friends. And they will still crawl into bed with us at the end of the night. You cannot do that to a cat. <laughs> like, you cannot train a cat with a choke chain or prong collar and expect it to do what you want it to do. If you're using sound scientific, data-based, proven techniques that are humane, using positive reinforcement, whether it's clicker training or mark reward training, clicker training's under that umbrella, um, using a reinforcer that the animal finds uh, worthwhile to work for, and that you have a good relationship with that animal, you can train it to do anything. In fact, dog trainers go to a thing called clicker camp, uh, chicken camp. Um, Bill Bailey, I believe, was the person who first came up with this idea of teaching dog trainers to be better handlers, better timing, uh, get better technique by training chickens to run an agility course. And I think this is the most fascinating idea. Like if you can train a chicken to do an agility course, or teach a tiger to volunteer its tail uh, for a blood draw, you can teach a dog to do pretty much anything. So in short, I think, yes, cats are as trainable as dogs. It's just that dogs are way more forgiving of us and our bad handling and our bad techniques and our bad timing. And they're more willing to figure it out because we bred them to be looking to us for information. Great question. Okay, the next one. How accurate are dogs at detecting COVID-19? Well, this is, this is timely, right? Um, I'm in week six of quarantine. I don't know about you guys. Um, you can tell by my Brillo-like hair and this zit that's been, I should probably name it. We should probably give it a good name, like Alfonso. I like it. So Alfonso's here helping me out. Um, but so COVID-19, there's a lot of discussion about dogs that should be able to be trained to detect COVID-19. And while as of today's date, April 28th, 2020, we don't have specific data as to how uh, reliable their detection is on specifically COVID, we can look to some other things dogs have been able to do in the past, and we can make an educated guess as to how they would do with COVID. Um, I'm going to be checking my notes for accuracy throughout this, so I'm sorry if I'm looking down a lot, but just bear with me. Um, so according to Professor James Logan, head of the Department of Disease Control at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, we know that other respiratory diseases like COVID-19 change our body odor so that there's something detectable that these dogs can mark and say, that's what I smell. Um, previously, these dogs uh, could detect odor from humans using socks worn by infected malaria patients. And they, were, um, and they were able to detect malaria in those socks with a higher degree of accuracy 
then in a let's just see if we should study this further test. So this wasn't even like a, a big, let's get thousands of people and thousands of cases. This was just should we investigate this further uh, trial? Um, these dogs were more uh, accurate at detecting malaria in these socks worn by infected patients than the World Health Organization standards for diagnostics. So that's just saying that these dogs were better than our low bar of saying, yeah, you have malaria. So that's pretty cool. Assuming that COVID detection dogs could pick up a detectable odor, it would take about six weeks to train these dogs. So if you've ever taken a nose work class, and if you're curious about nose work, I've got some, some resources up here. Um, it should take about six weeks to train these dogs to accurately and consistently identify the odor of COVID-19. Then we can take these dogs, which they're trying to do right now in the UK. There are six dogs. I'm going to have a, a picture of them up here in a second. These six dogs are hopefully going to be able to detect COVID, and then they can go to airports and they can pick up the odor of COVID or how it changes our odor as humans um, on even asymptomatic carriers. Now, doctors, ERs, medical professionals are super concerned about the asymptomatic carrier who's out there who doesn't feel sick, who's not wearing a mask, who's not maybe taking the proper precautions because I feel fine. Um, these dogs should be able to pick up COVID on those patients, single them out, get a rapid test done, and if it comes back positive, they can be put in quarantine and get treatment. So hopefully these dogs can be really an amazing force at helping this pandemic, this global pandemic that has caused destruction over the entire world right now. So this is really, really great if this could work. But again, it hasn't been proven yet. Uh, let's see. Um, the dogs who have been trained for COVID-19 could potentially detect the scent of the virus. Um, for reference, dogs can detect lung cancer in the blood with an accuracy percentage of 97. So 97% accuracy. That's crazy. Um, that's better than our current most advanced technology. That's amazing, right? Um, so for malaria, those dogs um, that were sniffing the socks of the infected patients, um, they could detect if children who were wearing the socks, um, they were correct 70% of the time for infected children and 90% of the time for uninfected children. But that, while in and of itself is super impressive because those dogs were sniffing frozen socks. Those socks had been sitting in a freezer for months while these dogs were being trained to detect malaria. Um, and malaria does go through several stages and it's easier for the dogs to detect in the later stages of the malaria life cycle. Um, it did prove that some of these dogs were picking up malaria on kids at the time that did not test positive for malaria. So they were saying that these dogs were able to detect malaria that the kids were not symptomatic of it and were not confirmed cases. Months later, the dog sniffed the socks that this kid has malaria that sock said the kid did not have malaria, but then in later it's determined that the kid did actually have it at the time that they were wearing the sock. So that's pretty crazy that the dogs were able to detect this illness, even when our medical staff was not able to, to confirm that the kids had malaria at that time. Um, dogs could also be accurate in 90% of prostate cancer detection, and they can detect breast cancer on human breath alone. And for somebody like me, um, my mom had breast cancer at 31 and again in her 60s. So I'm what well, we would lightly consider higher risk for the disease. Um, I've been getting mammograms since I was 24. And that's super scary. It's painful. I'm subjecting myself to radiation every time I go to get a mammogram. And it hurts. And it bruises your entire chest. Um, it's not fun. It's cold. Those rooms are always cold. It's the worst. Um, but if I could have a dog come and just smell my breath and prevent me from having to go and get this done and subjecting myself to radiation, I'm not yet 40. Um, and I've been having to get mammograms pretty consistently since my 20s. So I think that would be a big sigh of relief for me, especially if it's as accurate or more accurate from the dogs until I get a little bit older than I would probably do at my 50s going forward. So 
I think all things considered, we know that dogs can smell these things. The potential for them being highly accurate is good. It's really dependent on the if those dogs can find a marker that they can detect with their noses reliably enough in more than one human. So if the disease changes all human odor in a similar way, they should be able to find it. Excellent question. Okay, next question. Okay, in Toy Story, the human toys have feelings. So in the movie of Toy Story, we got to know what the lives of the human toys are like. But are dog toys alive too in that world and what would their life be like? Who hurt you? <laughs> like, I don't think I can watch Disney Plus anymore. How does my dog know that there are other dogs outside? Well, this is a little bit more up my alley. So in, as we covered in the COVID section a little earlier, um, dogs have an incredible sense of smell. They can smell 40 feet under the ground. So they can smell all of those hibernating critters, uh, mice, voles, bumblebees, uh, ants, all sorts of animals that live underground. And especially in the winter time when animals go to burrow, they can smell all of it. So in the fall and in the spring, if you see that your dog is a little more jazzy out on their walks and they just really want to keep their nose to the ground, let them check. They're investigating four basketball nets um, of standard 10 foot height below your feet. That's pretty crazy. That's magic. And we should let them do that. Um, I would, if I could. Um, let's see. Their noses are basically like Superman's x-ray vision. Right? So, of course, they're going to be able to tell if there's somebody outside. Um, if, if your dog um, can hear things down the street, too, they can hear them at a much, uh, their ears are way more sensitive than ours, in short. So, if there are kids outside, even if they're down the street, your dog is four times more likely to be able to hear it. And to put that in uh, more relative terms, if we can hear something at 20 feet, so maybe twice the length of my bedroom. Dogs can hear it at 80 feet, so he could hear it in the next house over. So their hearing is super sensitive and they can hear at a higher frequency than we can too. And an anecdotal story, my Border Collie and my Greyhound, uh, years and years and years ago, before my husband and I were married, he used to take the bus home and our bus would stop at the end of the street. Now, the bus would stop at the end of the street several times a day. But the dogs knew which bus my husband got off of. And as soon as they could hear the bus, the squeaking of the brakes, they would stop. They would look out the window. I think they basically knew about what time it was. But several buses went by at that time. So how would they know which one he was on? They could hear the squeaking of the brakes from down the street that I could not hear. And then they could smell my husband based on how far away he was. Once he got within 40 feet, they knew that it was him. And they were able to, from down the block, know that my husband was home every night. So don't ever underestimate your dog's abilities. They have superpowers. And I think it's pretty, pretty cool. Next question. All right. A-I-T-A. -A. For the uninitiated, that is, am I the asshole? All right. It's a whole subreddit. It is joy. If you <laughs> don't mind not safe for work language head over to AITA on Reddit. It is, it's amazing. It's amazing. But this one in particular caught my eye. Um, so for the, um, for this question, this woman who said that her friend was feeding her dog a vegan diet and she got really upset because like it looked like the dogs were sick and malnourished and unresponsive or just kind of lethargic and that she felt it was the right call to call the doggy Popo to come and help their dogs. And then the SPCA ended up taking her friend's dogs away from her. Um, couple things here. Is she the asshole for calling the cops? She's calling them the cops, but she specifically said the SPCA law enforcement department. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not like you had a concern and it's a valid concern because dogs are omnivores and they require different diets than we humans would require. 
Um, I personally am a vegetarian. I have been since I was a teenager. Um, I would never think that my diet would satisfy that of my dog or my cat. Um, who's not in her house right now, so <laughs> she's usually in there while I'm filming, giving me side eye. Um, but if you were to give your cat, let's go back to cats here for a quick second, cat a vegan diet, you would kill that cat very quickly. Like that cat would get very, very sick and die because cats are obligate carnivores. They, they are not omnivores. They can't survive on anything but a, a massive meat diet of some form or another, whether it's kibble or can or whatever. Dogs are omnivores. They could probably get away with a vegetarian thing from time to time, but they need meat too. Their bodies are built for it. Um, and the fact that the SPCA ended up taking the dogs away indicates to me, at least on the face of it, without having both sides of the story, I'm not a vet. I'm not trying to be here. I definitely don't advocate for giving medical advice, and I'm not. I will say here that the fact that the SPCA ended up taking the dogs away from her indicates that they thought that there was something seriously wrong, enough to take the dogs. So as the friend calling the SPCA, no, you are not the asshole, the person giving the dog a vegetarian diet, I'm assuming it was not recommended or required by a veterinarian. She, he or she might be the asshole. Um, the SPCA taking the dogs is in, more indicative that there was something going on, whether the animals were significantly malnourished maybe they saw something in the home that was a little bit more alarming maybe the dogs um maybe yeah it's really hard to speculate but I would think that there was a lot more going on and that's why they took the dogs and you were right to call now if you ever are concerned if you should call the SPCA law enforcement division or the animal control or anything like that to report something, it doesn't hurt to report it if your concern is genuinely with the animal. If you're going to be a Becky on the internet and just call because you're mad at your neighbor, that's a different story. But if you're truly worried about the welfare of the animal on the property, it doesn't hurt to call and have somebody who has the authority go and check. And if they validate your concern and they take the animal, then you were right and you did something to help an animal. If you're wrong, you still at least did the thing that means that might have helped an animal. Maybe the owner got educated. Maybe the owner is going to change their ways and the animal is going to be okay. Um, or maybe there was a warning. Maybe there's 30 days and I come back out and I check. And if things haven't changed, then I take your animal. Like... There are many things that go on behind the scenes with law enforcement cases. Um, the law enforcement cases um, tend to be really emotional and really hard. Um, I work as a senior trainer at the MSPCA at Nevins Farm in Massachusetts. We've had a couple of really high profile cases lately come through. And while I don't work with those animals directly, um, I see the animals after they're, tr after they're homed and then they come into my classes. Um, but you can't help not hear the stories and see law enforcement come in. And while you're teaching a class, you look out the window and you see the SPCA, the MSPCA animal control, um, the law enforcement van come up and animals coming out of it. It affects you. And, and you know that somewhere that animal was hurting. Um, and I think this person was correct to call. And if you're ever concerned, just call. And if it's a problem... Somebody will handle it. And if it's not a problem, at least you can go to bed at night knowing that you do what you're supposed to do. It's a good question. All right. The last question. If all the people died, what would domestic dogs look like? <laughs> I love this question so much. Um, so without human intervention, purebred dogs just wouldn't exist. Full stop. They would... <laughs> Dogs are going to shack up with Shih Tzus behind barn doors and do whatever dogs do. Um, and we're not going to have purebred dogs. Golden Retrievers don't look at another Golden Retriever and be like, hey, hey. <laughs> like, um, they're opportunist. <laughs> they're going to take whatever opportunity they can get. Um, but we do have a lot of dogs um, that we can actually study. And, and folks of the ilk of like Ray Coppinger, um, who studied the unowned dogs for I think pretty much most of his researching life. He died a few years ago. 
Um, but he studied the 83% of the dog population that are unowned. So of the world's billion dogs on the planet, about 83% of those dogs do not live in a house, do not have a care, a primary caretaker. They are unowned. They might live on garbage heaps or on the streets or in off like somewhere on an island um, foraging for food. So many, most of the world's dogs are unowned and are not purebred. So they all tend to have, no matter where you go in the world, very similar traits, which I think is fascinating. Um, they tend to have um, upright pointed ears, kind of more like a husky. They tend to have a narrower head, a short coat, medium size, and a brownish tan kind of coloring. Pretty similar no matter where you go. I'm going to put a picture up here in a second. Whoop. Picture. Um, so similar to purebred dogs who have been selected for largely their appearance to pass on their genes to the next generation, village dogs and, and more um, wild dogs tend to pass on traits that allow them the best chance of surviving without human intervention. The medium size means that they're formidable enough um, to maybe protect themselves but bigger than small prey like fox and rabbits and mice, but they're small enough to be able to escape larger predators and not need a lot of caloric intake. The pricked ears are less susceptible to ear infections, which can kill a dog without human intervention. And those ears are not gonna get torn off in fights. Natural selection is pretty impressive and it plays out again and again and again, no matter where you look in the world. So looking at these examples, what do you see? Are there size similarities? There's a general shape, kind of similar color coordination. Um, if you watch a lot of HGTV, you'll see like a very similar color spot here. Um, but do you see any Afghan hounds? Do you see pugs or bulldogs? What about an Irish setter? The dogs with the pushed in faces, we call that brachycephalia. So like pugs, bulldogs, uh, Frenchies. And that makes it really hard for dogs to regulate their temperature and breathe appropriately. Um, these dogs just simply would not survive. They would not be able to pass on their genes, especially if you're looking at like the old English bulldog and the French bulldog who from, well, let's just say from the beginning of a puppy, uh, puppy's conception to the end of the, the birthing process cannot happen without human intervention. French bulldogs and American bulldog, sorry, uh, old English bulldogs generally need to be uh, created with artificial insemination because tab A and slot B do not line up. It's not a jigsaw puzzle that, well, is going to work. So that in and of itself, they can't be bred. Then when the birthing process starts, the mother cannot push the babies out because the baby's heads are too big for the vaginal canal. So they have to be cut out of her system uh, using cesarean section, which is pretty common, but that also means that those puppies are going to be a lot more expensive because they can't occur or be born naturally. So those dogs would definitely not survive if humans were not here. Um, and I think um, it's important to keep in mind that some of these dogs on the islands might have a smaller nose, maybe a more brachycephalic look, but they wouldn't have that severe pushed in face like they ran face first into a brick wall. Um, you would get the occasional floppy ear dog or the occasional longer fur, the longer legs, but that's genetics. Like I'm five foot four. My dad was five foot eight. My mom was like six feet, 3000. My brother's over six feet. My sister's taller than my husband. And then there's me. So like occasionally other genes do express themselves. Um, you get those, those weird ducks in the family, those odd ducks, um, hide all the odd ducks out there. Um, but generally speaking, across the board, you, if you were to look at a, a bell curve, most of these village dogs fit right in the middle of that bell curve with the occasional outlier. Um, genes are weird, <laughs> and I think that's what makes it so cool. Um, if you were to look at something like the German Shepherd, that sloped back and those weird hips that they have, um, without human intervention, hip dysplasia would not be able to be cured and these dogs would not survive. So that gene would probably die out. That hyper, the hyper breeding that we've done to exaggerate traits in breeds over the last two centuries 
has been phenomenal. Um, if you look at what we've done to dogs, like the old English bulldog, if you look at one from like 1920 to today, the way that the skull has been morphed into something that's unrecognizable is insane. And we've done that to them. Um, we've done that to them so they would be our companions and because we think it's cute. Um, the same with golden retrievers. Like they look a lot more puppy dogish, like all the time or shih tzus, like their face is getting smaller, their eyes appear to be getting bigger, but it's because that orbital bone is getting shallower. So a lot of them have eye problems. So the things that we do for visual aesthetics for our dogs, um, to have a dog that looks the way we want it to look, even if we're using the excuse of, well, its ancestors did X, Y, Z, and this would help it, that's basically false. The American German Shepherd cannot do the jobs that it was bred to do without veterinarians going in and fixing those hips and keeping those dogs medicated um, for pain. And that's just the facts. That doesn't mean that these dogs are less good or less noble or less anything. They're still our friends. Um, but I think if we look at these village dogs and what has been selected for survivability, and we look at what we've done as breeders to these dogs, I think maybe sometimes we should take the foot, our foot off the gas pedal just a little bit and let Darwin kind of help us out and, and bring these dogs back to neutral and stop breeding for those hyper-exaggerated traits and bring them back to a neutral. So if we weren't here, maybe they'd have a chance to survive. Um, so thank you to Reddit for all, well, basically for existing. <laughs> thank you so much for being there for me, Reddit. Um, and thanks to science for just being so cool. Um, oh, and thank you so much to my friends on Facebook for submitting their quote, broken dogs who were sleeping. Um, Beth Grierson, Dan Marr, Gwyneth McKinney, Jess Fernandez, Jarden Winkler, Brooke Kahn, and Heather Gay. And to the other two to 600 dozen people who submitted photos, I'm just gonna start asking for dog threads on my personal Facebook page because guys, that brought me so much joy this week, just looking at all of your dogs sleeping. It was the oxytocin boost that we all needed this week. Um, and for all of you out there who watched this far, thank you so much. Um, this, these things are fun for me to do. It's keeping me a little bit more sane. It's keeping me in, uh, researching things and having a project to do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions or if you would like to see me present on something, go ahead and send it in. Um, my name is Melissa McHugh McGrath and I'm the co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club. It's the oldest AKC obedience club in the country. Because we're an obedience club, it's not a confirmation club. So you're not going to see um, just dogs walking around in a big circle and getting judged on their appearance. We are judging on obedience and we allow pet dogs, purebred dogs, mixed breed dogs, any dog can come on into our club and learn how to sit down, stay, heal, all that fun stuff with positive reinforcement techniques. Um, I also am a senior dog trainer at the MSPCA at Nevins Farm in Methuen, Massachusetts. And I teach tricks and sports at every dog training center in Danvers. If you have any questions or topics for me to cover, I would love to hear from you. There's no question, obviously, too silly um, or too serious. I'm happy to cover all of them, as you can see through this presentation. Um, if you're curious and you want to follow me online, you can find me on Mutt Stuff. It's a group on Facebook, um, and it's a pretty collaborative group. We're a lot of fun over there. We post silly memes, and we just kind of, and I'll put up some training videos, but it's pretty collaborative. Um, Twitter, at Mutt Stuff. Instagram, Melissa McHugh McGrath, and my website is melissamchughmcgrath.com. Thank you for coming. See you later.